I'm Maddie Myers, and the name of my talk is The Objectivity Myth, or Why Games Need Gonzo Journalism. And um, sadly, Gonzo doesn't refer to the Muppets at all. I wish it did, but instead it refers to a type of journalism. I know I'm not talking to journalists here, so that's why I'm going to define it right away. So a lot of people think Hunter S. Thompson came up with the word, but it was actually used to describe him, and at this point he doesn't even really use it to describe himself, but it's the best possible term I have for what I think games need in terms of critique, so I'm going to use it. Sorry, HST. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on subjectivity when you're doing Gonzo. You kind of cast yourself as a character in your own story. You use the first-person voice. You don't try to say just the facts. You admit that you were there, whatever event you're covering, and you reflect that. And you also might even include your own biases while you write. You might include some personal thing that happened to you, like, I was having a bad day, so here's why this affected me in this way. And that would all be part of the story. Ideally, it would be well-written and not boring, too. Um, so here's a quote that I love from him in an interview where he denies being Gonzo, incidentally. If you want to look up this interview, it's great. Objective journalism is one of the main reasons American politics has been allowed to be so corrupt for so long. You can't be objective about Nixon. The full quote, obviously, is about him admitting that he has opinions about politics. And the idea of writing about something and not admitting that you have those opinions is pretty illogical. But it's something that tech journalism and games journalism has been trying to do since day one, and failing, in my opinion. So why am I equipped to talk about this? Well. I've been writing about games since 2007, but I haven't been doing it for traditional video game media outlets. In 2007, I started an internship at the Boston Phoenix, which if you're local, you know that the Phoenix went out of business in March of 2013. I worked there all the way until the end. I was the senior web producer, I was one of the main people who wrote about video games and tech while I was there. And the Phoenix newsroom had simultaneously an old school newsroom feel combined with what I would call an emphasis on gonzo reporting. Although they wouldn't have necessarily called it that, they might have called it memoir style or just personal essays. There was never a piece in the Phoenix that wasn't using first person. Using first person wasn't weird there in the same way that it might be at IGN.com, for example. Since March of 2013, I have had to find a different place to write about video games, and I've tried some different places, and none of them are quite right. I've written for Paste, which is the main place that I write now. I've written for Kill Screen. I've written for Game Ranks. I've written for some weird little zany type things like Reaction and 5 out of 10, and It's Just a Game. And none of those have the institutional power that the Phoenix had, and none of them have people on staff who are familiar with the history of journalism. By that same token, I have found that a lot of games journalists do not have the same history with journalism that I do, or that many other journalists in other fields have. They have a completely different experience with journalism. And a lot of that is due to that emphasis on objectivity, logic, technology is pure and unbiased, we will tell you whether the program works or not. It almost doesn't matter whether that history is real. We all think it is. Of course, if you go back and look at old Nintendo Power, or old Electronic Gaming Monthly, you can find stories where writers write about their feelings and use the first person. But collectively, games culture thinks that it's about objectivity, and that thinking is still here. So it doesn't even really matter how many exceptions you find. So that is how I ended up so darn weird, I guess, because while I was at the Phoenix, I was so intimidated by my coworkers, having grown up reading IGN, by the way, and being a sort of internalized misogynist myself. Luckily, the Phoenix shook that out of me. Um, I was very lucky to work there instead of IGN, incidentally, because they wouldn't have cared. Um, <laughs> so the Phoenix was so intimidating to me that first year that I went out 
and bought this book, The New Nerd Journalism. And that was published in 2005, so a couple years before I started interning there in 2007. So it was like a pretty contemporary book. And that book was called such a silly name because it was a makeover of the new journalism, which is a term that originated in the 1960s and 70s, and which HST sort of also remade himself with his gonzo style. But even the new journalism, while not necessarily gonzo per se, was still really emphasizing the subjective personal experience of telling news and talking about your experiences. And the new new journalism was about going even further than that, taking that level of honesty, personal honesty, to the limit. So I also learned about things that a lot of online media, which much of games journalism is, does not have anymore, like a hierarchy of editors and secure funding models like actual print ads, which by the way, you as humans all tend to look at those a lot more than you ever looked at online ads. Nobody in online advertising has quite figured that out yet. Good luck to whoever you are. I'm glad I don't have your job. But yeah, you are clicking away from those things. You are just not acknowledging those banner ads. None of us are clicking on those. People haven't really figured out how to adapt old school advertising to new school media. And that's been a serious problem, which I'll get to later. But the Phoenix respected video games in a way that other old school publications did not at the time and still don't. They actually put video games into the art section. And from day one, they were like, you're an arts critic. You're writing about art. When you write about news, you're still covering the arts. And this argument that video games have about, oh, I'm a reporter, or I'm a journalist, or I'm a critic, it doesn't really exist, or didn't at the Phoenix. The people who were there who were music critics also identified as music journalists. There was no division there because everybody was already doing the same type of personal subjective writing. It was already accepted that you would be. So even though some of my older coworkers at the Phoenix didn't like that video games were in the art section, the younger ones advocated for me, and I learned along the way to advocate on my own that video games were art, and I also was like, you know what, yeah, they are, and I kind of got over that whole weird thing where I was reading IGN all the time. And since that time, since the Phoenix has gone out of business, I've stayed in touch with all my coworkers, and I've tried to explain to them what it's been like to write for places that are on what they call Video Game Island, which is to say Video Game Press, which has its own land where weird things happen and people in the mainstream press don't even know what's going on. And sometimes it gets so huge that y'all finally find out about it, like Gamergate this month. But most of the time, weird things happen in video games and nobody else in the mainstream press covers them or cares about them, even though supposedly almost everybody plays games now. So that's weird too. While I was at the Phoenix, there were a lot of games bloggers who came to prominence in the early aughts, we're thinking. So they were called the Brainy Sphere because a lot of them hung out at a blog called Brainy Gamer, and these are their names. Mitch Kripata also worked at the Phoenix with me, writing about games, which is how I would have even understood that this, these things existed, being a young person. These folks are all like five to 10 years older than me. So they, they sort of paved the way for blogging online, and at that, in 2004, Karen Gillan wrote this sort of famous manifesto called The New Games Journalism. But what's tragic about that manifesto is that the actual book, The New Journalism, as you can tell by this super old school cover, came out in the 70s. So like, he was already behind to be saying, hey, games should finally be doing this thing that other journalists have been accepting for years, which is to say, not obsessing about objectivity. But he wrote that in 2004, and people still share it, and it's still controversial 10 years later. Anyway, many of these people have gone on to work in the industry or leave it entirely due to getting burned out, probably because the battle that they were fighting, I would say they did not win. Currently, games journalism is still on an island. So these are arguments that people in games are still having a lot, like daily. And they're all basically the same argument over and over, and it's kind of a non-argument. 
I, I don't even know why the argument's happening, <laughs> but I'm just gonna put it up here with Gonzo's face because I don't get it. Um, so I think part of it is due to this also super famous in 2007 Clint Hawking post. I have heard people jokingly say, Bioshock invented games criticism because like apparently we never had anything interesting to write about before Bioshock came out. <laughs> no, <laughs> there were plenty of interesting things to write about. It's just that those bloggers were rising to prominence during the same time period that games like Bioshock were coming out. It's not that people wouldn't have had plenty to say about Custer's Revenge at the time if people had only been writing about games back then, really. Um, but anyway, so here's this quote by him. We could say that games criticism is for game developers and professionals who want to think about the nature of games and what they mean. Game reviews are for the public, for people who play games, and they are intended to help those people make decisions about which games they should buy. Now, if I could carefully explain this to Hunter S. Thompson, I'm sure he would agree with me that this is bunk because it is assuming that kids today don't really care about serious issues and that if you talk about games as being art and you seriously critique them, or if you talk about games culture in a way that really battles it and takes it to task, you don't think that consumers will care and you don't think they'll read it. I just don't think that's true. So we end up with this false dichotomy that Hawking had drawn out, but that has already been existing and still exists. But if you draw this false comparison, where do you put game reviews? And I personally see game reviews as being experiential writing as well, by the way, because you're talking about experiencing exploring a space. Everybody explores that space differently. So you kind of have to use the first person when you write a game review because I might not play the game the same way that other people do, and that's fine. So you can use Gonzo in your game reviews too. I think so. And what about attending video game events? If you're reporting on that, you as a person are going to experience that event, that fight night, that tournament differently than every other person in the room. And it's just more interesting to cover video games that way. Other media has already been doing it. Here's the other problem. The people who I wanted to highlight for this talk who I want to just tell you about, the people who I think are doing gonzo, do not identify as journalists. And the reason why they don't is because journalism has been so wrapped up in this tech objectivity bubble, only in games, by the way, like I told you at the beginning of the talk, music critics slash journalists don't have this problem. They see those words as being basically synonymous. Same as other kinds of journalists. The, journalist just means you are journaling. It's just another word for writer. It doesn't, these distinctions don't matter. But in games specifically, the word journalist has taken on a particular objective fetishization. So like Lee Alexander wrote this long piece, which I recommend reading anyway, because the entire piece is actually about how she's navigated being friends with people at Irrational Games and being friends with them before and after the economic collapse of Irrational Games. And she didn't know how to write about that because she felt biased. So basically she's done this fantastic gonzo piece about those friendships. And throughout the piece, she keeps taking a step back and saying, but I'm not a journalist, which is a very unusual affect unless you understand the culture in which she's operating, which is a culture that associates the word journalist with something different than what I, person who has been proud to call themselves a journalist because I worked at the Phoenix, a place where it meant something completely different, would not understand. And Kara Ellison is also doing gonzo journalism, and she even refers to it as gonzo from time to time, but she doesn't like the word journalism. This is a tweet she wrote, if anyone calls me a journalist ever again, I'm going to drop kick them into the sun, even if they are nice, especially gaming journalists. Again, that's because the word games journalist or gaming journalist symbolize something different to games. And it's sort of like how people don't always want to identify with the word gamer because it has all these cultural trappings and baggage, but they might still be playing games. But I would say it's more to do with 
how the history of journalism has not been present for games journalists at all. They don't know that history. I'm pretty sure none of them read the new new games journalism, and that's fine, but I would really like them to read it. <laughs> Even if they aren't calling themselves gonzo journalists, these are some writers who I recommend because that's what I think they're doing. So Lee has self-published several eBooks that are heavily first-person based. She writes about her experiences going to conventions, which is something that many other people cover in a purely, or try to cover in a purely objective way, as though you could ever do that. And she also wrote a fictional short story about the unearthing of those old ET cartridges. She didn't go to the unearthing, but she wrote a short story about what it would have been like if she had gone, and she invented fake journalists who are based on real journalists that she knows and parodied them. So basically, in a classic HST move, you really don't know which parts of the story are real and which are fake. And Kara, like I said, has been doing these embed with stories. She's been funding them on Patreon. I'll get to Patreon in a minute. Jen Frank, she recently won an award for games journalism in 2013 for a piece that is a preview of, of a video game, which is like, if you know anything about games journalism, that's like the lowest of the low kind of writing that you can do. Like, okay, this, this person's going to show me their best possible version of their game. It's probably going to be like super cleaned up and super polished, and I'm not going to get any truth here. It's going to be the opposite of truth. It's going to be all performance. But this piece is Jen talking about her personal experience in life playing the game, which is about death, her own experiences with death, actually having an honest conversation with the developer, it includes all the trappings of a purely objective technical game preview piece, except that it is written in a gonzo style. I don't know how else to describe this piece. It's worth reading. Jen Frank recently quit games journalism, which is another story entirely. Um, and also Maddie Bryce has quit as well. And she has some great writing about classism in games, Usually she puts those insights into stories about how she has attended a physical event. So she'll do reporting on that event, although I'm sure she wouldn't call it reporting. That's what it is. She will quote people. She'll describe her experiences going there and also talk about her own experiences with classism, racism, and so on. And Lana Polanski did something similar. She lives in Canada and she visited GDC and wrote about her experience interacting with the homeless in San Francisco during that time. And as a person coming from Canada, she wrote about how they have completely different social policies. So her insights were incredible to read. Are you noticing anything in common with all of these writers? <laughs> They're all women. That's like so weird, right? So games journalism is super, super behind. And it is so behind that games journalism still thinks that if you write about your personal experience, that's like totally girly. And I mean, Hunter S. Thompson would beg to differ, I'm sure. And I do think that the next trend that we will see in games journalism is that it's going to be okay for guys to write about their personal experiences before it's really okay for women to do it. And we've already kind of seen this with like a couple of people at Kotaku, like I, ironically enough, Nathan Grayson, who has come under fire recently for being too personal in his games writing, or perhaps not personal enough, I can never tell. But he, he did some coverage of GDC that I, I it, it's not quite gonzo, but it, it's getting there. He, he wrote from the first person, and I, I appreciated what he was trying to do. But he's working for Kotaku, and so they have their own particular editorial style there. And Kirk Hamilton also did a piece once about a preview of The Sims that he did, where he did like a timestamp for everything that happened in the game that I thought was interesting and fun because he talked about his personal experience playing the game. Again, first person, actually being honest, actually talking about what your personal emotions are while you play the game, as opposed to acting like you can play a game objectively. But um, those are pretty much the only two examples I can think of. And it's worth noting that all the other women that I listed don't work for institutions. They're not supported by institutions. Lee is the only exception to that, and she is a contract worker. She has contracts with several publications, most notably Kama Sutra for the purposes of this talk, but she is not a salaried staffer at The New Yorker. She, is mo she identifies as a freelancer still. So 
obviously this isn't new. I, this is just me doing yet another manifesto. So you can call this one the new, new games journalist, journalism if you want to. But the reason why these annoying manifestos about how games journalism is bad will probably continue for the next couple decades is because we're still so far behind, but also we have no way to catch up now. Because the institutions that taught me what I learned about games journalism, like one-on-one -on -one editing, mentoring from editors on a daily basis, going into a newsroom, talking to other people at the newsroom, laying out the paper together and talking about what the theme of each issue would be, those things don't exist anymore. The money that was once there to support those things is gone now, and internet media hasn't really figured out how to replace it yet. I think that will happen, but I'm worried that some of the more valuable aspects of this history will be lost before that time comes. And I don't really know what to do about it other than keep proselytizing, I guess. <laughs> so these are just some things about how games journalism is also a classist institution and how journalism has also become more of one. The barriers to entry are really high. You basically are expected to work for free for a very long time in order to get in the ground floor of games journalism, and that's true of mainstream journalism too. But I don't know what to do about that, but it does explain why the kinds of people who you're seeing succeed at games journalism are rich white dudes whose parents are like helping them pay for that apartment until they get that sweet staffing gig at fill-in games publication here. The people who you really want to be reading from, the real gadflies, the people who are going to be pushing back against those systems, can't necessarily afford to keep stringing along in an environment that isn't supporting them. And as for crowdfunding, since I'm almost at the end of my talk, I'll slip this in. I don't like crowdfunded journalism. I hate that it has to exist. It's a necessary evil, but it's an evil born of the fact that journalism is doing so poorly right now. And what, what Patreon has done for journalists has encouraged them to be direct competitors with one another. And you can tell how many funds each individual journalist gets per month and like all of these things that were never an issue when people actually work together at individual publications now are an issue when individual journalists have to crowdfund their work. Also, it's just not as good for other reasons like you don't have the institutional supports of an editor helping you out of a tight spot or like legal protection or health insurance or any other thing that comes with having a physical newspaper office, even if you aren't making newspaper, even if you're just making a website. And um, also I worry that these people don't have a way to get better. That's no offense to them. Obviously I just linked all their work. I think it's great, but a lot of them can't afford to hire editors to help them. And a lot of them aren't getting the kinds of one-on-one -on -one help that I got when I worked at a paper and I just don't know how we're going to get back to that. This is my last slide. Go back. No, <laughs> previous. There we go. Um, I hate to end on such a downer, but I'm just going to read this quote first. I can't think in terms of journalism without thinking in terms of political ends. Unless there's been a reaction, there's been no journalism. It's cause and effect. So I guess I just hope that I convince some people in all of the talking that I do about this specific topic to react because the journalism that I'm seeing now from a lot of games publications is not causing a reaction. It is just, oh cool, there's a new costume pack for SF4 Ultra, that's great. That's not anything. There isn't enough actual talking about what is happening in the games we play, at the conferences we attend, like politically, socially, monetarily, none of that is being challenged by anyone and the people who are trying to challenge it aren't being supported. So you might say this talk is journalism because I'm hoping that you all go out there and support these people, even if just by giving them their page, a page view. That's good enough. That's it.